I know our time will go very fast, so I'll jump right in. Sure. Um, I obviously knew about the death of your mother. It shocked the journalism world, shocked the world. <laughs> um, and I remember at that time thinking, what I know a lot of people have said to you is, Malta? You know, I knew very little about Malta. It's something that <clears throat> we think of these deaths in Russia and other places. Um, you decided to start the book by giving quite a history, really interesting history of Malta. I know you're probably tired of answering this question, <laughs> yeah, I'm but, not did, at all. but um, when people <laughs> say to you, I didn't know this about Malta, yes. give, um, in case there's some of us out there that don't realize what's going on there and what your mom faced, just tell us a little bit first there. So the, the, the thing is that that surprise that something like this could happen in Malta in the campaigning play to our advantage, precisely because people people never expected it. So when when we campaigned around Europe, I remember MPs telling us, you know, this is something we, we expect from Russia, no. from a lot of the posts, which is a horrible thing to say, really. You shouldn't expect it no. anywhere. But, th but we never thought it would happen in Malta. And I think that's because it is the European Union's smallest member state. Um, it, it isn't big in terms of population, its economy isn't big. And it mainly fixed in people's minds as a, as a place of tourism. But, and, and this is why I get into the history in the book, the country transformed itself, especially over the past 20 years, into a global offshore haven. So its size didn't matter really. It just became a conduit for all these illicit financial flows. And when Malta joined the European Union 20 years ago, um, it, it became appealing, right? Because it was like an entry point for all this money, all these people. It was suddenly no longer just a, you know, a, a new state, right. a former colony on the outskirts of Europe. It was a way into the European Union. And for my mother as a journalist, that meant she went almost imperceptibly, really, from reporting on low-level Maltese corruption or corruption contained within right. this small island to reporting on global corruption that right. was passing through the country. And we'll get to what she was investigating and how her career changed and, and what she was investigating right before she was killed. But first, maybe just tell us a little bit about your mother as a journalist, sure. how important she was, and as, as a mom, what it was like growing up with her. Um, it, was, it was never done. Um, the <laughs> didn't, you, <laughs> didn't your dad say something in the book, like it was like helter-skelter? Uh, yeah, very helter-skelter. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. It was like getting blood out of rock interviewing him. But um, <laughs> he, um, she, and, and again, this speaks to the history of the country that, I, I never thought about these things before I sat down to write the book, but she was born in 1964, two weeks before Malta became independent. And her life, or the arc of her life, um, traced the country's kind of hopes and, and ultimately failures that uh, in all these promises it made itself, that it would be independent, it would be wealthy, it would yeah. be democratic. And for a short time in the 60s, so when she was still a very young child, it looked like it might happen. But in the early 70s, um, the country, as was the fashion around the world in a lot of newly formed states, became very left-wing, closed off its economy, um, and tried to develop an independent economy, so its own industry closed off from imports. And, and so this was the period my mother grew up in, the 70s. And it, what that meant was, you know, to a young person, there were barely any products in shops, um, barely any clothes, one brand of chocolate, one brand of toothpaste. And, you know, you can have all the high-minded arguments you want about whether it would grow industry or not. But to a young person, to a child, really, that, that affects you in a, very, in a very important way. But at the same time, because it was a former colony um, and, and she grew up speaking English, she had access to the British press. So my maternal grandparents subscribed to all these British magazines. And, 
And so through those, this, this other world, a richer, more open, more democratic world was brought home to her. And uh, very early on, she, she started asking why life in Malta was so different to life outside it. And that carried on really until um, her early adulthood. And by, the, by that point, so the late 70s, early 80s, the country had become very violent. Um, so there was a really ugly partisan violence. Um, there was real tension between the Catholic Church and the governing party as well. Until the mid-80s, mid-late 80s, Malta had its kind of end of history moment. Again, like was happening in many places around the world, where there was this really crucial election, where the pro-West, pro um, more liberal political party won a general election and slowly started turning the course of the country's history. And it was around that point that my brothers and I were born, so 86, 87, 88, um, all mistakes, according to my father. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and so we, we grew up in, in this kind of, the second wave of optimism. Right. So we had independence and people thought this is it. And then in the late 80s, early 90s, Malta was on this path, or maybe reverted to that optimistic path. And we were on this track to join the European Union. The country was becoming richer, it was opening up, it was becoming slightly more cosmopolitan. And my mother started writing around then as well, so right. the very late 80s, 1990, she started writing for the Sunday Times of Malta. But this killed me that in your book you noted that until that time, journalists didn't even have no. their bylines. They wouldn't write under their names. There this were is no the 80s. There were no bylines. So yeah. my mother was the first she was the first woman to write a column, and also the first columnist to write under their own byline. Wow. And that was 1990. Um, and, and that speaks to that real culture of fear and violence mm -hmm. that, that preceded that point, so the 80s, the 70s. And it, it was, as my mother said, like a double shock, this thing. First, that you had a woman writing yeah. a column and, and in her own name. And... Um, I, look, as children, you know, we were, we were mainly interested in ourselves, <laughs> but um, <laughs> we, but I, I think even, even when we, uh, we were young, it was, it was apparent to us that our mother was different because none, almost none of our, our friends' mothers worked at the time, right. so I think the labor force participation rate of women was about 30% um, when I was growing up. And it was just very unusual, the way people would talk about her, who does she think she is, why is she writing these yeah. things. And as a young boy, you would see that. You'd you would hear it, you'd you hear know. It. You would go yeah. to people's houses, you would hear them say mm -hmm. things like that. And, and you would hear it on the radio. You would hear yeah. it, uh, people talking about it on, on the TV. But... Um, we largely, <laughs> we largely ignored it <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> as children. And then uh, only when we were a bit older, when it became much harder for my mother to, to shield us from it, when we were able to read the news ourselves, that we really realized what was happening. Well, tell us that terrible, the f when the first sort of threats started and you came home as a young child. Yeah, so the, so the, first, so the first arson attack was 94. And, th and this was her first big story, actually. She was reporting on um, a drug trafficker, mm -hmm. drug announced trafficker, whose, whose father happened to be the, the brigadier of the armed forces of Malta. <laughs> and, and in that role was responsible for controlling trafficking into the country. <laughs> um, and she, she had, in 93, this big splash about, really about the father, the brigadier, and how scandalous it was that he hadn't resigned. And, um, and it, was a front page, it was a front page splash on the Sunday Times. Um, and obviously we were too young to, to know b the implications of it or anything. But a year later, when the son, the trafficker, was in prison, 
he began making threats against various people. So in 94, um, my mother brought us home from school, which is something she, she used to take us and bring us back. She brought us home from school in 94. And the, fir the first threat was actually um, our dog, Messalina, who was a border collie, um, lying dead across our doorstep in a, in a pool of her own blood. And, and my mother hurried us up inside, and I don't, I don't even know to this day what she did with the body. Um, she probably called my father to come <laughs> home. Um, and I, I'm embarrassed to say, until I was about 14, I didn't know what really happened, because she told us Messalina had eaten snail poison, which is something that happened with a Labrador we had. And I, I, said, I said to Matthew when I was about 14, my eldest brother, isn't it funny how Messalina had snow poison and, and bled out like that? And he told me, no, Paul, you idiot. <laughs> Someone slit her throat. Um, anyway, and then a few weeks after that, again, my mo we were at home. My mother had brought us home, and the front door, the wooden front door, went up in flames. While we were all inside at home, we, we live in the countryside. It was a very open house. And, um, and my mother ran out and said, oh, don't worry, I just dropped a lit candle against it. Um, and, and things like that would keep happening, you know. I, she used to check the underside of her car quite frequently. I never thought why. Um, but again, when we became older, it became impossible to hide those things. And at that time, what was she writing about predominantly that was causing the threats? So when, uh, after that trafficker story, she began writing very critically about multi-society. So it's politics, you know, misogyny and multi-society was a big thing. If you look back over her articles, the kind of influence of the church on Maltese public life. Um, the environment was a big issue very early on and continued being one. But starting in the 90s, it was Malta's hopes for European Union membership, which right. she saw as a kind of silver bullet, I guess, that would resolve all these issues we had around governance, human rights, around the functioning of our democracy. She thought, we'll join the European Union, and once we do, will we'll develop, acquire the institutions that um, other EU member states have. And then in the, in the mid-90s, the, the opposition party, at the time the Labour Party was, was a Eurosceptic party. And just let me interrupt you just for one moment, just to, just to explain what the party system sure. is there. It's two parties with a strong influence of the Catholic Church. Uh, so yes, that that's right. So it's, it's the kind of Westminster model so like the UK, without the upper chamber, so just one house of parliament. There are two very, very powerful parties. Historically, the church was very powerful. It isn't really anymore. And the parties are the Nationalists and the Labour Party. So in the 90s, the Labour Party was, was anti-EU, and, and this affected my mother really badly. She saw it as, as really like an existential threat. If, if, if the Labour Party wins the general election of 96, then we'll go back. It would be like going back to the 80s, which terrified her. And, and if you look at her columns, which I quote in the book, you see she says, I don't want my children to grow up in the 80s and yeah. 70s like I did. So it was that, really. And in, the Labour Party did, in fact, win, only, <laughs> only to, to lose power 18 months later. And you could see in her writing this sort of optimism return. But then something else happened, that those kind of higher aspirations that Malta would become more, more democratic, would have more robust institutions. Because remember, right, we, we decolonized in 64. There was never any yeah. proper institutional reform since then. And no one really thought of it at the time. But in effect, we just replaced the colonial governor's office with the prime minister's office. But, but those powers were still there. The prime minister became immensely powerful. He, had, he or she had power over the, the judiciary, the police force, real, really strong unchecked powers. 
And for a long time, that didn't seem to matter. And, th and then we joined the EU and we thought, OK, now we're in this club of well-governed nations and, and things will only get better. Instead, um, and, uh, and none of us really realized this, and certainly there was no evidence of my mother really thinking of it in her writing. What happened is the country became much richer, a much more globalized economy, but shot into that really globalized world with these rickety, um, effectively colonial institutions. Right. And so, the, so these two things crashed against each other. And, and this is why I, I said in, imperceptibly, my mother went from reporting on you know, the Maltese drug trafficker, yeah. his brigadier father, the corrupt Maltese politicians, the Maltese Labour Party, to finding herself reporting on bribes paid not in the thousands of euros, but in, in the millions and tens of millions of euros. Because suddenly that was the prize, you know, that was the prize in, in this globalized economy. And the corruption was just so rife. I mean, as your mom would find out, going right to the top. It was, it was, it was staggering. And I, I think it, it was so shocking that people almost couldn't absorb it. So then the real turning point came in 2013 where the country elected, and again, it's funny, no one saw it at the time, but Malta was this kind of bellwether because it was 2013 and Malta elected a very populist yeah. prime minister who promised everything, you know, a, a more globalized economy, a richer economy, civil liberties and, and higher government spending. And, and in fact, did deliver on, on those things, and, but used them as cover really yeah. for, for you know, enriching himself, um, his ministers enriching themselves. And it, again, my mother almost immediately, you know, one of her first stories under that new government in 2013 was on the sale of, of our passports. And I mean, literally the sale, right? It wasn't, initially didn't even have the pretensions of an investment program. People could just pay 650,000 euros in cash for a Maltese passport, right. which of course is a European Union passport, right? right? So they're picking it up to, to live in the UK, which they still could at the time, or France or Germany or whatever. Um, and, and, and the same for banking license, you know, they were, they were just being so low. And of course, a Maltese banking license allows your capital to go anywhere in the European Union. And, and it was one story after another, one story after another. But at the same time, the country was growing really rapidly. And, um, you know, a country where divorce wasn't even available until 2011, suddenly had same-sex marriage. Um, so there was this really rapid, almost disorienting change. Yeah. And, and so people were, were either just blindsided by the corruption or distracted by everything else that was that was happening you know or, or more prepared to forgive it right. because the country was growing so fast and you mentioned that malta was you know if we'd been paying attention back in 2013 it could have indicated so much of what we're seeing now with populist governments around the world and i want i want to get back to that if we have time at the end because i think that's really interesting it's similar to what maria reza yes. talks about in the philippines yes had exactly. been watching there Maybe we would have seen some things coming with Trump and others. Um, but back to your mom in terms of at that time, when she started to like place her for us uh, just how important she was, how popular she was. Because I don't think we have an equivalent here. I mean, there's just no. not. She was a lone voice there in many ways. It was a really strange situation. And I, I think because she started out in that way as the first woman to write a column, and her, her opinion pieces were really strong already very early on. And right. I, believe me, I've had to read a lot of <laughs> Maltese news pieces from the 80s and 90s, and they are they're <laughs> dull as dust, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the country was changing so much, and, and no one was saying anything. You, and you had a great line in here. You said, Malta has been experiencing drastic change since 1987, but the papers were like her sons, overtly male with nothing interesting to say. <laughs> <laughs> I highlighted that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> but your mom was different. And she, she was very different. And very she started a blog. And she yeah. started, and so she, well, she was sacked from, from 
the Sunday Times for writing about the president's daughter who, um, who was acting as a lawyer for that drug trafficker. Anyway. And you were at school with the drug traffickers' kids. Was yes. That the same case? It is a small Very country. Very small country. <laughs> <laughs> and, Very small. And, but but it, it is still extraordinary to think back on, on how small it was. I mean, I, when I go home, I, I bump into these people. Anyway, the, so, so she was sacked because the, the um, sorry, it wasn't the president. It was the deputy prime minister who later became the president. Anyway, he was also on the boards of right. the newspaper. Oh, wow. Anyway, she was, oh, wow. she was sacked. Her, her editor told her, we can't run that piece. We can't run that piece. And she said, fine, I'll take it somewhere else. So she took it to the Malta Independent. And her editor, you know, like, uh, most editors would, would say this. Her editor said, once you went there, you can stay there. And she did. So she carried on with a column with the Independent for the rest of her life. But even then, she felt very restricted, very vulnerable. She thought, if that ever happens again, I'll, I'll have nowhere to write, she said, 10 days before her murder. She told it, an interviewer that. And so in... Um, in 2008, she started a blog, when, when blogs, at least in Malta, were very new. Yeah. And, and it hit the country like nothing, this blog. It was wild. The, the, because she was writing blog posts every day, right? And you have to set it against papers, which were, were quite stale, very conservative. And so suddenly people had access to her writing, not just twice a week, so she did a column on Thursday and Sunday, but every day, multiple times a day, and it was free. You didn't even have to go out and buy a paper. And, you know, I remember the first, there was an election that year, and around, during the election campaign, her blog was receiving like 400,000 visits a day. So the, that was the population of the country at the time, 400,000 people. But people would read it in the morning, go home, read it after work, they would read it on their lunch break. Yeah. And, and they would comment a lot, and, and this was a, an attraction of the blog, my mother would reply, so it was very interactive. And it was radically new and different for Malta. But the, but the costs were huge because she was introduced, first of all, to a much wider readership. Again, not just people who bought newspapers, but everyone. And um, she became more recognizable. Um, going out became difficult, you know? She could never go anywhere. People would stare, they'd gawk. Um, people would slash her car tires, scratch her car, you know, shout at her in the street. It, it was... It was a lot. It was Your a, house it was set on fire again. Our house was set on fire again when I was about 16. That was a more serious arson attack. It was, you know, it was intended to kill, to kill my mother. I mean, my father was at home as well. I remember you said in the book that you came home. You came home at 2.30 I came home. I was, I was out quite late. <laughs> and um, then got criticized in the public yes, that's for right. being allowed to be out that late rather than the fire. I was, I was doing my A-levels at a... <laughs> at a Jesuit sixth form college. <laughs> um, and I stayed, out, I stayed out quite late that night. I came home at half two, and there's a kind of lane leading up to the house. Um, and a friend dropped me off at the, at the end of the lane. I was walking down, and I, I saw smoke coming up from the back of the house. And I thought, how strange that they're doing a, a bonfire at half two in the morning. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and of course, then I, I heard the sound of cracking glass, you know, when yeah. glass cracks in heat. And then I realized the house was on fire. I ran in, woke my parents up. Um, my father and I threw soil onto the fire. So a, a group of, of people had stacked car tires and put in bottles filled with petrol in those car tires. And what, what was happening to her as well? You said, you know, she became more and more isolated. Mm. Um, but also, I think what was happening to her is very relevant today. We talk about this in journalism circles all the time in terms of the harassment mm. and the backlash against journalists online and the, the way that they're maligned. Yes. So tell me a bit about that, because she went through some awful misogynistic... Yes, I, uh, the, uh, the strange thing is this. I, I think it was the internet abuse that was the most damaging, uh, mm. uh, certainly the most oppressive, because it was unrelenting. Yeah. 
And I'm sure there were people in the country who would have wanted to try to set our house on fire every day, <laughs> but, but they couldn't. There were physical constraints. It was just impossible. But, but you know, you could, you could come and send an email you know, every day. You could, send, you could do that multiple times a day. You could set up a blog dedicated to harasser, which, you know, which happened. And it, it was, again, it was unrelenting, really, really vicious, really awful stuff. So uh, early on, people had began, began calling her the witch, you know, the witch, and she's ugly, she's this, she's that. Uh, but I, th I guess the internet just industrialized it, the misogyny, the abuse, the harassment. Um, and, and her world just kind of closed in because s the harassment deliberately was spread to her friends. So it became much harder for her friends to spend time with her. She felt if she met her friends at a restaurant, then they'd be harassed, which would happen. She couldn't go to the beach, she stopped swimming. And, and her world totally closed in. And I, by this point, I had moved away. I was living in, in London. But I, I would see it every time I went back, and I'd go back quite a bit, you know, at least three or four times a year. I'd, I'd see that she looked a little less healthy every time, um, a little less happy. You know, it, it really, the house became her world, the garden became her world, and the garden became, <laughs> in response, more beautiful because it was the only space she had, and she put everything into it. You know, she would spend most of the day on her laptop, on the phone, um, and then for relief, go into the garden and plant more citrus trees, and it became a kind of really, really rich place. But um, the, the, the online stuff really, really just swallowed up her, her life, I think. Yeah. And you mentioned Maria Ressa, and, and that really yeah. was her experience as well. It was horrific, the abuse, and it continued after her death. Well, I, I can't remember if this in the book or an interview you gave, you said, but the day she was murdered, there were people celebrating. Yes, that's right. Line. And uh, there were. And uh, so a group of, of journalists that got together after her murder did an investigation where they found all these, you know, covert campaigning groups, uh, troll farms, I yeah. guess we'd call them now, which had been set up purely to harass and discredit right. my mother. Tell us, Paul, about the investigation she was working on yes. um, right before she was killed. So uh, a big project of that 2013 government was a privatization program of our energy sector, our hospital sector, and a lot of infrastructure projects as well. The, my mother didn't even know that her biggest story was the energy privatization deal. Because what happened is, in 2016, she began working on the Panama Papers. Um, and through that leak, so a leak of offshore data, which unusually, really exceptionally, allowed people to see the, the real beneficial owners of offshore companies. So through that leak, she saw that there were two Panamanian companies that were set up at exactly the same time, four days after the 2013 election, by the same Maltese accountants for two Maltese government officials. One was the energy minister and one was the prime minister's chief of staff, a very powerful kind of power behind the throne figure. And, and she found this out through the leak. She reported it. It was a, a big scandal at the time. You know, there were protests. Um, but nothing happened, right? Because right. the Prime Minister was so powerful, he could stop or at least frustrate judicial and police inquiries. And, and he did that. And he also protected those officials, right? So they remained in power, right? Yeah. So we were in a situation where the country's most famous journalist reported that the country's two most powerful officials, save the Prime Minister, had these shell companies right. set up four days after they were elected to government. But she just didn't know why, right? She right. didn't know why they had set them up. Then, a few months later, she got a tip 
about another shell company. It, it was called 17 Black, and it was registered in the United Arab Emirates, so not part of the Panama Papers League, and so she didn't have the beneficial owner data. And for the final months of her life, so we're in 2017, she kept trying to uncover who owned it, alongside working on all these other stories. But she never got there, because she was killed in October 2017. After she was killed, my brothers and I had all this material, right? Her notes, her, her files, and so on. And we thought the one thing we can do with them that's useful is give them to other journalists. Mm. Initially, The Guardian and, and then Reuters. And they formed a, a team of journalists across a number of publications called The Daphne Project. Um, one of their first stories, so April 2018, was on the energy privatization deal. And, and the summary is this, that the 2013 government decided Malta should switch its energy system from oil to, to liquefied natural gas, which is in principle a good idea, of course. Only they bought the gas at a $40 million a year markup, um, and of course, this required changing the country's energy infrastructure, right, from, from an oil plant to a gas plant and, and all the rest of it. And the government gave that contract to a quite young Maltese businessman in a, in a tender process that already then looked very corrupt. Anyway, so that was the Daphne Project's first story, that there were these huge um, unexplained differences in payments for the gas. Um, their second round of stories was in November 2018. Um, that found or included a story that that company, 17 Black, the United Arab Emirates one, was owned by the man who won the privatization tender, hmm. Jorgen Fenech. Um, weirdly, there's this symmetry because almost a year to that date, November 2018, November 2019, Jorgen Fenech was arrested on suspicion of commissioning my mother's murder. Right. We're going to get to where that case is. Um, just for those of uh, those here who don't know what happened to her, just bring us back to the day. So, um, so the 16th of October, 2017, my mother was working at home with my eldest brother, Matthew, who was also a journalist. Um, and she... Again, she rarely ever left the house, but that day had to go to the bank to see her bank manager about, there's a whole other story, but um, about her bank accounts being frozen. So the economy minister um, uh, sued her for libel as part of that case, persuaded the court to freeze her accounts in anticipation of damages. So she had access to none of her money. Anyway, so she left the house at about 3 p.m. Um, and got, you know, less than a kilometer away from the house uh, before a bomb that was placed under her car seat was detonated um, and, and killed her. I wish I could say killed her instantly, but it didn't. Um, there was a small explosion that flung the car forward and then a second explosion, which turned the car into a ball of flames. The explosion was so powerful, it was almost half a kilo of TNT, um, that it shook the windows and doors of the house where Matthew was. So he ran out barefoot, and so was the first person to reach the crime scene and, and saw the car on fire. Um, and then, you know, slowly people arrived. Um, initially a single police car, uh, and then the rest of the emergency services. By that point, Andrew, my middle brother, and my father, who were working in Valletta, the capital, had made it to Bidnia, where we lived. Matthew had, of course, called me. I was in London. There was this torturous period where I had to wait for the next flight home, which was at 8 p.m. Um, and I made it home much later that night. And it was, you know, we approached this valley leading to our house. and. You know, it was, it's just fields, really, and we grew up playing in them. 
And I, I remember my father who had picked me up from the airport saying, listen, get ready because it's, the valley is just covered in soldiers, police officers, and, and floodlights. And so it was. Um, and I, I remember that day perfectly. Um, the days that followed are, are this kind of blur that you know, people who, who haven't slept for days will recognize. <laughs> um, and it was very, very hectic, the initial period. And it kind of threw us into this, this world where we felt anything, anything could happen, anything could be done to us. And um, we're in court a lot from very early on, speaking to the police a lot. We were thrown into a, a variety of campaigns that yeah. I heard in an interview you said it almost looks like they were well organized, but you were sort of chaotically going from one thing to another, trying to get your mother's yes, that's right. murder I solved. Yeah. The, yeah. the funny thing is because, <laughs> look, we, we didn't know who did it on day one, right. and, uh, but we knew that the government's behavior towards us was so strange so so vicious, so duplicitous. After her murder. After like, her murder, yeah. that um, we realized something something was really seriously wrong, and that justice would have to come from outside of the country. And of course, the the benefit of being a European Union member state and the Council of of Europe member state is that you do have recourse to supranational bodies you know, a, a court of human rights, right. um, a, a European parliament. And one of the first campaigning trips we did was to the European parliament, which is where it was on that trip where one of, one of the MPs we spoke to said, we never thought this would happen in Malta. Yeah. Um, and, and really, from that day, I mean, we're talking a week after her murder, we started traveling around until now, it, it hasn't really let up. Right. Um, and I, I, I knew we wouldn't have time to get into everything, but we just have to go to uh, questions in the audience in about three minutes. But just, okay. just bring us up to speed about what happened in terms of the arrests that did happen. Okay. We're still waiting for the trial yes. this year. So, um, so three hit men um, have now all pleaded guilty. They were arrested very early on, on the strength of forensic evidence. Um, through that set of criminal proceedings, um, the hitman led to a middleman, and that middleman, um, facing an investigation into his own crimes, um, uh, decided to give evidence against the man who commissioned him who is Jorgen Fennec. So, um, and your mom was getting close to identifying Jorgen Fennec. She was, um, yeah. right? That was her big story. Yeah. She had, uh, separately to the whole Panama Papers story, she had received an enormous leak of data from Fennec's company. Right. So hundreds of thousands of documents, um, including e emails Fennec was sending about my mother. Um, so three hitmen now in prison serving two serving 40 years each, one serving just under 20 years. The middleman got a complete pardon, believe it or not, for the murder and all his other crimes. And Fennec was arrested on this extraordinary day in November 2019 and has been in custody ever since awaiting trial. And that's this year? It's to go I on. hope it will be this year. Okay. And you also um, were able to get a public inquiry into the... A big part of the campaign was to have a public inquiry, which, is, which was Malta's first. I don't know about, maybe Canada has had, England has had a lot, and it's the same yeah. judicial tradition. But M Malta never used that law. And uh, I don't know how, but we, it happened in the end. And that public inquiry reported um, almost two years ago now. And the headline finding was that the Maltese state is responsible for my mother's death um, for failing to have protected her life. So we'd failed to recognize the risks to her life. And it was almost a mafia state. Yes, so the judges, it yeah. was a panel of three judges, the country's most senior judges, 
Um, and, w and one of their findings was that the country was um, on its way to becoming a completely entrenched mafia state. Um, and that it was my mother's murder that began to kind of change its course. Has anyone ever been charged for anything in the Panama Papers or the? No, no. So not a single um, prosecution of anyone involved in the Panama Papers or all these other privatization projects with the hospitals deal, which is just amazing, right? She yeah. broke that story in 2016. And still nothing. Still nothing. Um, just one last quote, and then we'll go to the audience for questions. There's a couple mics around here, one there and one there, if you want to put your hand up. Um, one of the hitmen, when he was leaving court, this is just right at the end of your book, um, turned to your father and said, one day soon you will know exactly what happened. What do you make of that? I, I think the hitmen, um, the hitmen for a long time, ever since they were in custody, 2017, have always tried to implicate other people in the murder in an attempt to secure a better deal for themselves. Right. When they lost out because the middleman kind of, you know, offered up the commissioner, they, they found themselves in a situation where they had nothing to offer and for years kept making these noises about you don't know the whole truth. I, there is no doubt in my mind, in any of my family members' minds, that the prosecution's case is the case, that the hitman planted the bomb. By the way, another three men have been charged with supplying the bomb. Um, so seven, you know, seven men. Um, uh, the, the, the prosecution's case is, is, we believe, the right one, right. so.